Welcome again to our study on the 1689 Confession. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer as we begin. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much that we can gather together again. Lord, as we consider once again this the subject of the church, we pray that you'd help us to understand how precious the church is to you, that it is the bride of Christ, that we look forward to that great day when we will be gathered together for the marriage supper of the Lamb. We thank you, Lord God, that in the church here on earth we begin to experience a foretaste of the wonderful fellowship that we will have with you and with your Son through all eternity. We pray, Lord, that you'd guide us through your word for Jesus' sake. Amen. And we continue um, this week with our study on the church. You see there it is part 3 of chapter 26. Chapter 26 being a very long chapter. Uh, 15 paragraphs, one of the longest chapters of the Confession. Um, just to recap briefly, in our first study on this chapter, we looked at the universal church and then at the local church, particularly at the membership of the local church, that um, the membership of the local church is uh, what we call visible saints. In other words, people whom we accept as regenerate believers. Uh, the next time we looked more at the structures of the church and uh, uh, the leadership in particular, how the, the leadership of the church operates. And today we look particularly at uh, the communion of local churches or at interchurch relationships. Uh, and uh, here are just a few questions to get us thinking. How have Christians understood interchurch relationships through history? And uh, that interchurch there means interlocal church, relationships between the local church, not between denominations. What are the two approaches, let's say the two common approaches to associations amongst Baptists? Thirdly, do the 1689 Confession in the Bible support formal associations of churches? And fourthly, what should churches do in cases of difficulty or difference, either within a single church or amongst more than one church. So let's consider these in paragraphs 14 and 15 of the Confession. Here is just a brief outline um, of those two paragraphs. Firstly, the fraternal relationships of the local church uh, the, or the communion of local churches, its basic principles, its formal nature. Thirdly, its providential limitations, its spiritual benefits. And those first four all relate to paragraph 14. And then point five, it's special advantage advisory meetings. This is one of the primary means and methods by which an association of local churches does its work. Um, possible reasons, biblical basis, and strict limitations. Well, let's just uh, take a step back and uh, put Baptists in the context of Christians in general. Um, there are basically three views of interchurch relationships that uh, have found expression through history. Um, the, one, the first one is what we might call the Episcopalian view. Episcopalian is an adjective that comes from the word episkopos, which means bishop. So this has got to do with bishops. And this view is that local churches fall under a hierarchy of bishops and archbishops. It is the view that is found in the Roman Catholic Church and the Anglican Church and uh, a few others. Uh, theologically, the, the, the uh, principle underlying this is the concept of apostolic succession, uh, that the apostles passed their authority on to the next generation, but not of churches, of bishops going down from the hierarchy of archbishops down to the bottom. And uh, that is what we find in the Roman Catholic and Anglican and a few other church groups. Secondly, we have the Presbyterian view. Now, the word Presbyterian comes from the Greek word for elder. And the idea here is that local churches are linked together by representatives making up synods. Uh, synods, sometimes they're called circuits, a kringer in Afrikaans. Um, so you have a synod which, uh, which uh, 
represents a few local churches in a city or a part of a city. Now the thought here is usually of a wider authority rather than a higher authority. Many Presbyterians would uh, not want to say the synod has a higher authority than the local church, but that it has a wider authority than the local church. Um, this is the view found in most Reformed denominations. For example, in South Africa, the Dutch Reformed Church in Gierkerk, uh, or in America, the Presbyterian Church of America, and so we could go on listing hundreds of these denominations that are Presbyterian in structure. Now we should uh, take note here that within the Presbyterian view, there are two, dis two different emphases or two different approaches. Some Presbyterians, uh, Presbyterian denominations, view the Synod as having authority over the local churches. Uh, so this, the, the local churches must submit to the decisions of the Synod. And, and I think I'm right in saying that the Presbyterian Church of South Africa takes this approach. However, in other cases, the Synod functions more in the sense of making represent, uh, re recommendations to the local churches. Um, theoretically, um, as I understand it, this is what is found in the Gereformeerde uh, Kerk van Zuid-Afrika, the so-called Dopperkerk. Although I think in practice, um, many uh, people in that church feel that there, there is a sense of authority, um, that it is not just giving recommendations. However, there are other denominations in America where uh, a Presbyterian synod wouldn't give instructions to local churches, but simply make recommendations. The third view is what is called the independent view. Um, now, it would be lovely to explore through history how these have come to be. Um, and there have been times in history when there's been fierce conflict between these different views. For example, in the 17th century and the 16th centuries in England, there was a fierce, compet not competition, conflict between the Church of England and the Presbyterians. And then the independents also came into that uh, picture and uh, they were often severely persecuted. But the independent view is that local churches are autonomous, uh, in other words, self-governing. And we've seen that uh, in the confession, we saw it last time. Some representatives of this view are Baptists and Congregationalists. And then just as in the case of the Presbyterians, um, we have sort of a, a spectrum of, of emphases within the independent view. Some independents defend the use of formal associations. In other words, um, they would say, yes, it is right for churches to associate with one another formally, to say we together belong to an association, to say we as a group of churches are going to cooperate in certain ventures. Others believe that informal fellowship is all that is required by the scriptures. So we don't have any centralized structure um, uh, churches, ministers, members of churches may come together from time to time to encourage one another, but there's no sense of joint decision making. There's no sense of a group of churches together taking responsibility for something. Rather, what, what would happen in that setup is the churches would say, well, or the representatives in their informal fellowship, well, we need to do something, won't you? Uh, let's say uh, Bloemfontein Baptist Church, take responsibility for this project. And so nothing is done except by a local church. There is no centralized structure. Now, if you think carefully about it, there is not a great deal of difference between the more formal understanding of uh, the Baptists, of the independents, where you have formal associations with autonomous congregations, compared to the uh, looser Presbyterian view, where the synod functions in the sense of making recommendations. Those two are in practice very close together. Uh, uh, let's say a loose Presbyterian view and a uh, strict, not strict, but a, uh, an independent view where formal associations are accepted. Those two are actually very close together.
But let's see what the 1689 Confession has to say about this, and we need to look very carefully at the wording. Uh, the first section of paragraph 14 deals with the basic principles of um, the fraternal relations between local churches. You'll see that many texts are given there. Let's just read the, the section together. All members of each local church are engaged to pray continually for the good and prosperity of all churches of Christ, wherever located, and upon all occasions to assist other believers within the limits of their own areas and callings in the exercise of their gifts and graces. So just to, to um, anchor that in Scripture, uh, let's look at Ephesians 6 verse 18. Um, Ephesians 6 verse 18, Paul says to the Ephesians, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers <coughs> and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Um, and this is very important for us to recognize that um, if you think about the uh, world in which Paul lived, communication wasn't what it is today. There was no cell phone, no email, not even telephone, not even a, a formal postal system. Uh, there was no motorized transport. So sending letters apart from anything else was quite an undertaking. And yet, even with those limitations, Paul urges the Christians to be concerned for one another and to pray for one another. And he recognizes a certain belonging of Christians to one another, even if they're not from the, the same local church. Pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert, and always keep on praying for all the saints. Now, the second point listed there is assisting other believers in the exercise of their gifts and graces in 3 John 5-8. Uh, dear friend, you are faithful in what you are doing for the brothers, even though they are strangers to you. Notice, here are Christians who come to Gaius, um, and they are strangers to him. And yet, uh, John says, they have told the church about your love. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. Now, that send on their way is something of a technical term which refers to showing hospitality but also providing for people in the next stage of their journey. It, it involves a recognition and an acceptance of fellowship. Um, send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. It was for the sake of the name that they went out receiving no help from the pagans. We ought therefore to show hospitality to such men so that we may work together for the truth. Very interesting there that uh, John is not only encouraging but um, really laying upon us as believers the obligation of working together, not only with those in our own local church but broader uh, in, in other local churches as well. So these are general principles. Now, how are they expressed? Well, here we need to look very, very carefully at the wording of the confession. The modern translation of the confession says, It follows therefore that churches should seek fellowship with one another. Now if you read that, that doesn't imply anything formal, anything technical, anything um, more than just fellowship, which could well be informal fellowship. However, the original wording of the confession says, So the churches ought to hold communion among themselves. Now, to us, the word communion either just means fellowship or it may refer to the Lord's Supper. But for the uh, 17th century English Baptists, the word communion had rather a technical meaning. And here is an extract from the minutes of the Midlands Association, second meeting of the Midlands Association in England on the 26th of June 1956. Uh, now, the spelling and the language is rather quaint here. But uh, take note of how the word communion is used. 
For as much as the churches do mutually acknowledge each other to be true churches of Christ. Notice there's a formal recognition by these churches of other churches as true churches of Christ. That is other churches in the association. And that it is their duty to hold a close communion. Each with other according to the rule of his word. And so be helpful to, uh, to each other. Sorry, each to other as God shall give opportunity and ability. And these churches are now desired to consider that they acknowledge each other and are faithfully to hold such communion each with other and to endeavor to be helpful each to other. And then in the minutes there follows some about five examples, specific examples of how they were to help each other. For example, giving. Uh, giving of advice so that when, when one church was in difficulty, the others were obliged to come and give advice. Or when there was a matter that concerned them all, they would give advice. Financial support, uh, particularly to the poorer churches. Cooperation in joint projects. Um, and uh, there are various examples of this sort of thing in the, uh, seventh, amongst the 17th century Baptists. One could quote many more examples from the minutes of these various associations, but the point is that uh, they all understood the word communion to mean formal association. And so when a few years later, three decades later, in uh, the 1689 confession we read the word communion, we should understand that it refers to formal association. Now, of course, we do not want merely to look at what, what historical practice is. We want to understand, is there a biblical basis for such cooperation? Um, for churches formally recognizing one another, for them setting up structures by which they would all associate together, and for them undertaking joint projects together, rather than just informally saying to one another, will you operate a theological seminary and you organize a conference and you do this and you do that. Um, what is the biblical basis? Certainly the uh, Baptists in England in the 17th century didn't just appeal to pragmatism. They appealed to many different um, texts in the Bible and, and biblical reasoning. Uh, just a, a, a few points here. The first basis of this kind of association is that because individual that individual churches each belong to one another, sorry, all belong to one another because each one belongs to Christ. And uh, we really need to take this one very seriously. Uh, Colossians 1 verse 24, um, in a sense this is the most powerful reason. Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. And there um, it seems that Paul, well, it seems very clear that Paul is referring to uh, the entire body of Christians as the body of Christ or as the church. So all Christians belong to the same body of Christ, apart from belonging to their own individual bodies of Christ in the local churches that they come from. In Ephesians 4 verse 16, from him the whole body, and uh, it would seem again that Paul is referring here to um, all believers, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. In other words, we do not only need in our growth, in, for our growth in Christ, we do not only need the Christians within our local church, but we also need the Christians in other local churches. And the early Baptists reasoned like this. They said, just as we all in the same local church belong to one another because we belong to Christ, so the local churches belong to one another because they belong to Christ. Um, and uh, that really is the foundation of this kind of cooperation between local churches. Is there any evidence for formal cooperation in the New Testament? Acts chapter 15 is often referred to here. 
And you might wonder why I've put a question mark at the end of that uh, reference. Um, Acts 15 is the well-known uh, Jerusalem Council uh, where uh, the problem arose um, in uh, Antioch that some people from Jerusalem were going there and trying to force the believers to be circumcised, the uh, Gentile believers. And so um, Paul and Barnabas went to Jerusalem to go and address the matter with the church in Jerusalem. And then the church in Jerusalem made a decision about it and sent instructions to the churches as a result of their meetings and their gatherings. Now often from both Presbyterian and Baptist circles, Acts 15 is used to say, well, there you are. Churches must come together to make joint decisions. There are, however, a couple of difficulties with that approach. The first difficulty being that there were apostles present in Acts chapter 15 at the council, and so they had authority to give instructions to other local churches. We do not have apostles present in any of our uh, associational gatherings today, and therefore we cannot simply take this passage and say, well, therefore a synod or a gathering of churches can impose uh, requirements on local churches. The other difficulty is that this seems to be more um, a meeting of the church in Jerusalem to discuss a problem that had arisen with some of its members, rather than a general synod or a general assembly or a, um, an ordinary gathering of a few churches. There are nevertheless principles that can be applied, but we need to be very careful about that. I think a much more helpful passage uh, in this regard is 2 Corinthians 8, verses 18 and 19, um, where we have clear evidence of churches not just having fellowship together, but engaging in certain projects together. 2 Corinthians 8, now this concerns Paul's collection um, of uh, financial support from the Gentile churches for the poor believers in Jerusalem. And now he writes to the Corinthians in connection with this collection. And he says he's sending Titus, and verse 18, and we are sending along with him the brother who is praised by all the churches for his service in the gospel. What is more, he was chosen by the churches to accompany us as we carry the offering which we administer in order to honor the Lord himself. So here is a brother who was an individual who was recognized not only by his own local church, but by a group of churches, Paul says all the churches, and not only was he recognized or praised by them informally, but he was actually chosen formally by the churches to carry this offering. And so we have churches not just saying, well, a church in Corinth, you take care of this, or church in Philippi, you take care of that. But let us appoint a brother together, and he will be representative not only of his local church, but of all of our local churches. Uh, 3 John 5 verse 8, we looked at earlier the principle of encouraging and helping people from other churches in their own callings. So there is a biblical basis of this kind of cooperation between local churches. Just briefly to complete the paragraph, uh, we see that there are also references here to the providential limitations of interchurch relationships. The confession says, so far as the providence of God provides opportunity. Well, if you are living, let's say, in uh, the 18th century, in uh, the jungle of the Congo, for example, and you have a small group of believers, they cannot practically form an association with another group of believers, uh, let's say, in Australia. Uh, it was just providentially not possible for them to do that. So we recognize as far as the providence of God provides opportunity, there must be this kind of fellowship. The benefits um, referred to here for the enjoyment of such benefits, and that refers back to the beginning of the paragraph. 
just uh, to, to put you a little bit in the picture for, uh, of the present time, how is this being implemented in the world today? Well, in the, in the United States, we do have a couple of uh, Reformed Baptist associations. The first one that I've mentioned there is called FIRE, which stands for the Fellowship of Independent Reformed Evangelicals. It is a group of churches um, that uh, unite together around the 1689 Confession. They are Reformed Baptists and they work together. It is perhaps a little less formal than the sort of thing we've seen here amongst the early Baptists, but nevertheless it is a very meaningful association of churches. Another one in the United States is called ABCA, the Association of Reformed Baptist Churches in America. Perhaps a little bit more formal than FIRE in terms of the relationships between the churches, but there are two associations who are seeking to implement this. And then of course Southern Africa, um, we're aware of Solar 5 which was established last year. And uh, just to, to show you how Solar 5 has picked up the spirit of the 1689 Confession, and we trust of Scripture as well. Um, an extract from the core values of S Solar 5 says, we affirm the principle of local church autonomy as well as that of the independent interdependency of local churches. So you see the principle autonomous but interdependent. We also affirm that local churches may cooperate with each other in order to unite their efforts and resources around common projects. We also deny that any local church should ignore its relationships with other local churches. You do amongst some Baptists and other groups as well, but you get this sort of fiercely independent spirit. Our local church is autonomous and while people may not say it, you sometimes get the spirit coming through, well, we don't really need the other churches. We can carry on um, by ourselves because we are autonomous. We are complete under Christ. Some areas of cooperation that Solar 5 is involved with is church planting. Um, there is a church planting work in Botswana that we are supporting. In a couple of weeks' time, I will be going to... Uh, Nell Sprite to uh, meet with a group of believers there who want to establish a church and there are other church planting ventures where we are helping one another as a group of churches. Uh, missions um, together the churches of Solar 5 have decided to support a brother to go to India to go and work with churches there. Uh, and to, to help with discipleship training there, leadership training. Um, Brother Jeff Gage from Boxburg was in Zimbabwe last weekend, along with Dennis Husted, and they had a wonderful conference there with about 50 pastors, and uh, they spent time giving training. As a result of that, the pastors uh, said to Jeff, well, can't you come and, and teach us more? Can't you give us seminary training? And so we see there the wonderful benefit of this kind of cooperation, this kind of association. Um, and uh, Solar 5, in the case of Solar 5, extending beyond country borders here to Zimbabwe, where we are able to go and help them. We are able to help one another in the work of the kingdom. It, it is really a wonderful opportunity. The last um, part of the confession, the last paragraph of this chapter, deals with advisory meetings. And uh, this really helps to make concrete and give us a concrete idea of how churches uh, can work together. The possible reasons for an advisory meeting, um, so let me just say an advisory meeting is, is having representatives of different churches come together to discuss a particular issue. So, for example, difficulties in doctrine. Let's say a group of churches is battling to understand a certain doctrine. Then their representatives should come together, not simply each one strike out on their own course. Uh, secondly, any issue where the peace, unity and edification of the churches are at risk. Um, relationship issues, perhaps. Matters of unjust discipline. Uh, which may take place in one church. Uh, perhaps a member of the church is disciplined by the church and that person feels it is unjust. 
Now, uh, a common objection of the Presbyterians to the independent structure is, well, what if a, um, a member of a church is disciplined unjustly? What recourse does he have if there is no higher authority than the local church? And Baptists in their independency have often caused injustice in this way and caused hurt to people who have uh, experienced wrong things in, in local churches. And there seems to have been no way of addressing that. That local church is just um, complete in itself. You cannot address such a problem. However, the confession clearly states that when there is such a matter, there should be a gathering of um, representatives. And notice that such a, a matter may involve one church or more than one church. So it is saying that if, let's just take uh, our example, Antipas uh, Baptist, Reformed Baptist Church has a problem uh, and it's, it's confined within the borders of our church, yet it is causing unhappiness within our church. We may not put up walls around ourselves and say to our sister churches, well, we're autonomous, you can't come and have a look what's happening here. If we accept that what the confession says is biblical, then we are duty-bound to open ourselves to the input of other churches. What is the biblical basis? Well, here there is some difficulty, particularly in relation to this fact that we have no apostles today. There are examples in the New Testament of instructions being given to local churches from outside, such as Acts 15. But the difficulty we always have is that these instructions seem to be associated with the apostles. And so how do we transfer that principle to a time when there are no longer any apostles? And I think what is helpful here is that we must go back to first principles. And I have an extract from a Sola 5 confession which is really an expansion of this particular paragraph in the 1689 confession. And we've tried to express the first principles here. It should be understood that the governance of a church is only valid to the extent that it conforms to the will of Christ the head. <clears throat> and because Christ's will is not defined by the decisions of a local church or of its leaders, a church may often be helped to follow Christ by obtaining counsel from other churches. You see, the point is that Autonomy, the autonomy of the local church is not the final and absolute and highest principle when it comes to the government of a church. The final and absolute and highest principle is the will of Christ. And so therefore a church cannot say, well, we are autonomous, therefore we're going to go ahead without checking that their decisions conform to the will of Christ. And uh, this is why um, we say that churches while they are not subject to one another, they are autonomous, they are expected to open themselves to one another's influence and counsel. Each church is responsible under God for making its own decisions, but that does not give each church an absolute right to do what it sees fit. It must open itself to the counsel and influence of other churches. And we could quote many texts here, especially from Proverbs, there is one example that the wise man listens to advice. It is a fool who refuses to listen to advice. And that is where the uh, 1689 confession derives its position from, where it says it is according to the mind of Christ in these cases that many churches in fellowship together should meet and confer through their chosen representatives. I've just uh, made a point there about present day experience. Um, I have come across Baptist people who have experienced hurt in Baptist churches precisely because of this autonomy thing where the church was not open to advice from outside and therefore people were hurt in disciplinary procedures and uh, many people as a result have left Baptist churches and gone over to the Presbyterians because of the hurt that is caused when a church does not open itself to influence from outside. Errol Hulse, who uh, uh, travels the world and uh, 
coordinates in various ways a fellowship amongst Reformed Baptists said a similar thing to me in, about people in England that he knows many Baptists who just have not been able to accept this thing of autonomy because of the hurt that has been caused in local churches as a result. And so they've gone over to the Presbyterians. This is why I pointed out in the beginning that there is not a huge difference between the looser Presbyterian view and the Baptist view which makes place for formal associations. Um, and uh, I trust you understand and, and see what the confession is saying there. The limitations of these councils, let's call them church councils, the representatives who gather together in the church council don't have jurisdiction over the churches to impose their conclusions on the churches. Uh, that is what the confession says. So they gather together, they make their decision, and they report that decision to all the churches concerned. That doesn't mean it is a decision which is imposed on everybody. However, mutual respect, fellowship, unity, and the honor of Christ play a very important role here. It is no good for a church to say, well, we're autonomous. We reject the uh, advice of all our sister churches and we're going to carry on uh, as we see fit. Um, you know, that is just an expression of foolishness very often. Um, and uh, it, it can happen and it, it does happen that where a church is clearly in the wrong, um, the association may disfellowship the church and that is the most it can do. The association can disfellowship a church uh, but it does not, that doesn't mean it is imposing on the autonomy of the church. That church can still carry on in its own way, it just simply may not be part of the association. And this is really how um, this whole matter is understood. In the confession it is um, it is the way Reformed Baptists in the beginning understood it. And I think if we grasp the essence of it and the spirit of it, it will help us a lot as churches to work together effectively. Just to sum up, how have Christians understood interchurch relationships through history? There are the three views, the Episcopalian, the Presbyterian, and the Independent. Two approaches to associations among Baptists are formal and an informal approach. Do the 1689 Confession and the Bible support formal associations? We believe so. And fourthly, what should churches do in cases of difficulty or difference? Well, they must get together. They must investigate the matter and they must seek to resolve it. Trust that the Lord would help us to implement these principles for His glory. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, when we discuss these matters, we realize that church life is often not simple. In the first place, you have called us to undertake great activities for the extension of your kingdom, activities which cannot be undertaken by one church acting alone. And therefore, we thank you for this opportunity of cooperating with sister churches we thank you, Lord, also that we are not left to our own resources when it comes to matters of difficulty or difference, but that we can help and encourage one another as sister churches. Lord, we pray that you would lead us and guide us along with our sister churches and all those churches in this world who are true churches of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name. And for his name's sake, amen.